this is Chase from CNC Commentaries, and today on CNC Movie Breakdowns, we're going to be talking about uh, another Christmas classic. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, the great Home Alone. And I, of course, couldn't do this alone. I am joined by my uh, wet bandit counterpart, Nando. Howdy. It's, it's another Christmas episode. We're back into the, the game. season. This time we're doing uh, Home Alone, quite the classic. Home Alone. A premise so simple, yet executed uh, so well. Yeah, it's that, executed uh, it, pretty well. It's, be, it's, become a, it's become a holiday staple. Uh, yes, that that is correct. Home Alone is very well known, and for good reason, too. It's pretty, pretty solid. A nice, nice little Christmas story. I mean, I guess, I guess we can probably get into our, uh, you know, our background on this movie. How did, how did you first come to this film? Well, you know, I got into this film the same way many people got into this film. I watched it on my family during the holiday season. You know, I first time I saw this movie probably years ago. You know. Just like everybody else, I've got quite quite a bunch of nostalgia for this movie. I think it's pretty good. And uh, yeah, that's that's uh, it's it's. Uh, this has been my first time rewatching it in a couple of years, so it was uh, it was nice to revisit. It was nice to revisit this uh, this movie. What about you, Chase? Well, how'd you get into this movie? Well, I do remember having this movie on a VHS and, um, I, you know, watching it around the holidays. But I don't, like, you know, when you're younger, you don't remember, like, the full story that actually goes on in the movie. Uh, and, uh, but, like, I don't, I didn't, like, have a particular, like, bond with this movie while growing up. Um, you know, I probably got more into it. As I got older, so I don't have like that same nostalgia, like attracted to it. But um, you know, it's it's a movie I watch every year around this time, uh, whether I choose to or not. Just because you know, you'll just be flipping around the channels, and then you'll you know you'll see it on because it's it's just one of those go tos, you know. And you know, if it's it's like one of those things where if it's like halfway through and you just want to flip it on, you you know you you sit down and finish it yeah and should we get into uh, a synopsis yes I'll do the synopsis oh why thank you alright Home Alone is a 1990 film and it's directed by Chris Columbus, and it follows the story of Kevin McAllister, an eight-year-old uh, whose family is going on vacation on Christmas Eve. They're going on a vacation to Paris, but his family forgets him, and they leave him at the house. And uh, these two robbers, the Wet Bandits, uh, they, uh, they, they want to rob Kevin McAllister's house. And, uh, hijinks do certainly ensue. And, uh, it's a grand old time. That's for sure. But, that is correct. Why don't we, why don't we dive on deeper now? Let's, let's get in, let's get into Home Alone, Chase. Okay. Well, I mean, right off the bat from these opening credits you know uh we get this uh whimsical christmas score uh done by the great john williams a lot of people you know don't put that together that you know oh john, john williams also did this yeah john williams has done basically everything yeah john williams is everywhere and he's um, always got good scores you know like like you said this is a christopher columbus directed movie but you know it was written by the great John Hughes, so um, you get the 
uh, get that nice family dynamic and also uh, sentimentality within the script while also getting the, the comedy as well. Yeah. And uh, for this movie's opening, this movie has a has a pretty n- nice opening. This movie gets straight to the point. Uh, so uh, this movie uh, opens up, and it has uh, the, there's this house, and it's just packed with kids, and it's just packed with a bunch of people. And uh, the reason it's packed is because uh, this family is all, they're all going on a trip to Paris for Christmas. And we meet, we meet Kevin McAllister, we meet his parents, and we meet, you know, his siblings and cousins. And uh, we also are introduced to Joe Pesci. Joe Pesci plays Harry. He's a robber. But the first time we see Joe Pesci, he's in a cop uniform, and he's, uh, he he is inside the Kevin uh, the Kevin McAllister house because he's trying to stake it out, so he can rob it later. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, you know, I, when you're first watching this, you don't know that that's him, obviously, or that's going to be him. And it's like it's never explicitly said that that's him. It's just kind of inferred that he's casing the joint, and then you get the whole thing with his the sparkle on his gold tooth. Yeah, um, but I I think it's a it's a neat little setup to show how he's kind of casing the neighborhood, and I feel like you know right as we're introduced into this scene, you know we're thrown into this McAllister house and the the like the rambunctiousness going on with all the kids and family around, you know figuring out how they're gonna pay for the pizza and you know just kids popping up here and there, going everywhere up the stairs, down the stairs, and, yeah. You know, re- it's it just shows that like there's a lot going on and it's easily it's easy to n- not realize everything that's going on w- at one point and um you know that kind of leads to them uh leaving a kid behind later <laughs> yeah and uh during this scene uh kevin McAllister is the youngest there and uh he's kind of getting picked on by all the older kids you know they call him helpless they call him an idiot until eventually you know the entire family is uh getting ready to eat some pizza but uh uh kevin gets into a fight with his older brother and uh he ends up you know pushing his older brother and that knocks that knocks uh some milk onto the onto the passports of the uh of the family and uh we see that as as they're trying to clean up the milk uh, you know they accidentally throw away a passport and uh, we see that you know Kevin is he's getting angry and uh, you know he's he's just getting frustrated and his mom is getting like you know upset with him because she did she doesn't like that he's like pushing people and uh, then you know she sends him upstairs and he's and then he's like oh I don't want to see you guys ever again and you know that's just that's that's just kind of the setup for what eventually happens yeah i mean it's it's that classic setup of uh you know family confrontation and then you know resolved by the end of like you know true meaning of christmas type thing yeah and you know uh you know i you know and we haven't even mentioned yet that um kevin is played by macaulay culkin you know young macaulay culkin and uh you know, this was, uh, you know, obviously his big break and um, what made him a, you know, a household name. Yeah. And uh, something interesting to say that during this whole scene is that we uh, eventually we get uh, a certain little snippet of a scene where um, Kevin and his older brother are looking outside of a window and they see a man shoveling snow. And Biff yeah. goes on like this horror story uh, about how this old man's like a murderer and how he hides his victims and while he's shoveling snow. You know, it's just kind of like setting up that this guy, or you, we're led to believe that this guy is evil. I mean, I, I doubt that they really expect the audience to think yeah. this guy is a crazed killer, but it's just, uh, you know, to get under Kevin's skin of sorts. And, um, 
you know, we get the, you know, not reveal, but, like, interaction between the two of them later. Yeah. And, uh, so eventually, you know, they, they, that fight happens, and, uh, Kevin gets sent upstairs, and he goes to bed. And, uh, you know, there's quite the storm on that night, and the power ends up getting knocked out. And the phone lines end up going down. And uh, so this knocks out power. And so the family doesn't wake up in time for them to be. Uh, the, the, they're supposed to leave at like, what was it? 8 a.m. And so, you know, they can't wake up in time. So you get this uh, really, I think, really good, like chaotic kind of scene where all the family is like running and screaming. You got the you get this really cool shot. It's kind of in like slightly sped up footage where everybody's like running around trying to get ready really fast. Yeah, it, ju- it just contributes to the the chaos in the yeah. house. Yeah, it's just and, leading up to the fact that yeah, with all the, with all these kids and all the chaos, yeah, somebody could realistically lose a kid here. I I mean, t- to a degree, right? Yeah, especially I mean, when and, this uh, neighborhood kid shows up. I mean, yeah, and so you know they're get they're gathering their bags, the whole McAllister clan, clan, and, um, you know, <laughs> and um, you know, figuring out who's going in what car, and you know, doing head counts and all that, and um, you know, they're just you know making sure all the precautions are in order before they they head out to the airport, um, and they're like, okay, you're going in this car, you're going in that car. You know, split it up, you know, six boys, five girls, uh, four adults, yada, 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 partridge in a pear tree. Yeah, and they do uh, they do a head count. And uh, this neighborhood kid kind of walks up and he, he starts like, almost like investigating uh, their, the, their stuff, like their luggage. And the girl that's counting all the heads of the of the children, she counts his head instead of Kevin's. So she thinks like, "Oh, everybody's here. We're good to go." And so they get on. They got on the bus and they they go. And you know they leave, and they think everything is good. And you get this scene of them I mean, running through I mean, an this, airport. This neighborhood kid might have just wanted a free vacation to paris yeah you know he could have infiltrated their their trip to paris so you get this fun scene of them running through the airport trying to catch their flight and you know they're they they're, they get to the flight in kind of like a late manner so they're just rushing onto the plane and they just get sat down on the plane immediately and uh you know they all sit down it's fine and dandy but then we cut back to the house kevin McAllister wakes up and he, he notices his family is gone. And, uh, you know, I think it's really interesting how they... Because this movie is kind of... Is kind of cut and is kind of, like, shot in three different ways. You know, we've got... We've got Kevin... We've got the family all together at the beginning. With uh, kind of Joe Pesci being there... Uh, staking at the house. Then we've got... The family without Kevin going to Paris and traveling. And then we have Kevin alone at the house, and then we cut to scenes of uh, the robbers, Harry and Marv, the wet bandits, that we get to I mean, see they, they don't do really stuff. even... They don't really even go to Paris, really. They, I mean, they land in Paris, but they don't spend time in Paris, per se. Yeah. You know, just as soon as they get there, they're out, or trying to get out, in the mother's case. Yeah. Um, but, you know... I, I think it's a good time to mention uh, how great Catherine O'Hara is in this movie. Yeah, as she, she's pretty good. The mom, you know, something that she does so well in terms of you know this movie and just other movies she's in is she's able to, um, you know, be like sort of like a grounded figure of sorts, and you know, like be judgmental at times, but also. Uh, also be like outlandish in terms of her reactions and just oh yeah uh, she's very good with facial expressions as well 
She she lands some good jokes. She lands. Um, but she's she's just a joy whenever she's on screen. Yeah. And as I was saying earlier, you know, we kind of we have the family without Kevin. Eventually, them realizing they don't have Kevin, them freaking out. We have Kevin alone at the house, and then we have the robbers doing their own thing. And then the stories kind of like connect with each other. Like the robbers try to rob Kevin. The family realizes he's he's gone, and the mother wanting to get back to Kevin. I th I think it's kind of really interesting how this movie is paced. I think it's paced pretty well. Uh, this uh, this movie is like an hour and I think like forty minutes, and you you really don't feel its runtime. I think that it's paced pretty well. Yeah, yeah, that, I I would ha I'd agree with you. It does um, go pretty quick once you get into it, really. Yeah. Um, you know, once the bandits, you know, interact with Kevin, you know, they keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then you, of course, know that eventually it will be resolved and the family will, you know, be back home. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, uh, Kevin, Kevin discovers that he is home alone, as the movie title suggests. And, uh, you know, he, he gets pretty excited pretty quickly because, you know, he, uh, he wished for this after all. And so you kind of get like this montage scene of Kevin running around in his house. He's watching movies that he shouldn't be watching like violent movies and he's he's yeah. eating candy you know he's jumping on the bed while eating popcorn it's just he's he's uh he's definitely he's being a kid yeah he's being an eight-year-old that's for sure um and i i think with something that we should give a mention is the movie that is seen inside this movie oh yes it's a classic Angels with a what is it? Angels with a filthy. Angels with filthy souls. Angels with filthy souls. And you know we don't we only seen one we only see one scene from this movie. And this is a this is a you know a false movie created just for this movie. Yeah, I, I mean I think a lot of people like now know that it's like that's a very famous thing you know that this was created just for this movie. Yeah. But like it's it's based on a real movie called Angels with Dirty Faces, so I think that's pretty interesting too. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the the little scene we get of this movie inside a movie is uh, this mobster talking to this older gentleman, and you know you get the classic lines like, "Oh, uh, how much do I owe you?" and uh, you know, "Keep the change, you filthy animal," and I'm gonna give you ten seconds to get your what what's the line? I, I, I don't remember exactly, but he, I think it's interesting how Kevin... I don't know how many times Kevin watched this movie, but how he's able to, you know, get the timing down to rewind to certain parts and fast-forward to certain parts and play it at the exact moment for timing's sake in terms of the confrontations with the, the pizza guy and the wet bandits is... Uh, it's uh, pretty surprising that he learned to do all that that quickly. Yeah, I mean, Kevin is a resourceful kid. Like, it's really kind of amazing to watch. You know, he's just so resourceful. Like, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but anyway, it's at this point in the movie where Kevin's mother realizes that she forgot Kevin. And, uh, you know, we just, get, we just get more scenes of Kevin having... Uh, fun you know he takes a sled down his uh he takes a sled down his stairs there's just more scenes of that and uh then we cut to the wet bandits uh staking out more places you know uh there's i i really like the dynamic between harry and marvin this movie yeah well, yeah and this is like our first actual introduction to marv mm -hmm. played by daniel stern um and, uh, you know, it's obvious that, you know, uh, Harry's the more talkative between the two of them, and Marv is kind of just goes along and, you know, does what he says type of thing. Yeah. Like, it feels like that's their dynamic, that Harry's the more, you know, mm -hmm. in charge of the two. Uh, yeah, but Harry and Marv try to break into Kevin's house, but Kevin, uh, he's thinking quick on his feet. 
and uh, he turns on some of the lights in his house, and that scares Harry and Marv away. And I, I think, you know, this is just a, a first demonstration of Kevin's resourcefulness and his quick wittedness. Uh, it's it's definitely a core part of his character. I mean, and we get these we get these great you know like shots of the house and this is this is a big house you know yeah it is a really it big makes house. sense why they're all i mean i don't know how well off these people are but this is a pretty nice house and to you know afford for that many people to go on a you know trip to paris you gotta be decently well off i'd have to imagine yeah for sure and so, you know, he's like, you know, and we hear that from Harry, you know, like, you know, these people have to, you know, have a good amount. You know, I've been staking them out for a while now. Yeah. And uh, so we get we get a scene of the uh, Kevin's mother trying to call the, the police station back home and get get them to check on Kevin. And you get this really funny interaction where she calls a police station and she's like, oh, this isn't our apartment. And she directs them to a, what is it, a crisis center. And mm-hmm. and so she tells her, she tells him the exact situation, but then he's like, oh, you need the cops. So he sends her back to the cops. And then Lady is like, okay, fine, we'll, we'll send somebody over. And uh, a police officer does come. But Kevin thinks it's one of the wet bandits, and the police officer is like, "Oh, nobody's here. This was a this was a crank call or something." And uh, we see that the family is trying to get the first flight back to Chicago. You know, we have these scenes where Kevin's mother is like desperately trying. I think it's done really well. Uh, Kevin's mother gets you know gradually frustrated through this movie because you know it's chris it's around the holiday season so all the flights are packed and uh i mean it, it reminds me a lot of a previous john hughes movie planes trains and automobiles and like the confrontation scene is steve martin at the uh airport and um trying to get a flight it reminds me a lot of that in retrospect and uh you know we see those similarities on how it's done of her, you know, eagerly trying to just be like, I just want to get a ride. I And, like, you can tell she's trying to get frustrated, but also keep her cool. And she's mm-hmm. like, look, I just want to see my son and make sure he's all right type of thing. I'm not trying to get too mad. Yeah, but eventually that ends, you know, she ends up kind of breaking later on in the movie. Um, uh, Then we get that classic scene with Kevin McAllister. He, like, hits himself on his cheeks and screams. Yes. Yeah, just the this movie has so many classic moments. It's just it's just great. Who would have thought who would have thought Kevin McAllister was a big uh Edvard Munch fan? Yeah, who would have thought? Uh but we get we get another scene of Harry and Marv breaking into another house and stealing all their all their things. And uh we find out how the Wet Bandits got the name the Wet Bandits. And it's not because they like water parks. No. So Marv, every time they rob a house, he leaves the water running. And which... Harry Harry doesn't kinda Harry doesn't really like that. Yeah, he he's like, Oh, this is sick. Cause like, you gotta think, like, that's gotta cost so much money. <laughs> You know the water. Well, yeah, it charges their wa- you know their water bill, but also like the water damage. I mean, and you'd think that you know they've been doing this for who knows how long, but you know that would leave a sign, and you know they'd be able to Connect trace them. something together, and then obviously that leads to their downfall later. Yeah. And uh, uh, we get Kevin. We get, we get Kevin out of store, and he runs into that man that his older brother told told him was a serial killer and uh you know he screams and he runs away he steals a toothbrush and then gets chased by a police officer but uh he manages to evade the police at eight years old 
I mean, he, he, he like he he go he just slides across on some ice like a penguin, basically. Yeah. And uh, you know he's able to run away. Yeah. You know, it, like he unintentionally steals the toothbrush, but it's still like I don't know. Does doesn't this cop have better stuff to be doing? Yeah. Why can't this cop catch an eight year old? Like this, this cop is is not very good at his job. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Harry and Marv they decide to try to rob uh, Kevin again, and uh, they actually have an interaction before they rob Kevin. You know, they all they almost hit him with the with their car. See, at that point, you know, they they recognize him kind of, right? Yeah, and uh... why not just run him over? <laughs> And uh, Kevin actually recognizes uh, Joe Pesci's character uh, because of the golden tooth. You know, it's just, uh, that's, I think we get like a couple of gold tooth shine throughout this movie. And, uh, you know, that's how Kevin realizes that, you know, oh, jigs up. We got uh, something's going on here. And so... Uh, to to fool the robbers, uh, Kevin c- makes a makes a little. He enacts a plan. He gets a bunch of like makeshift, uh, like dolls or mannequins, and he puts them at the window to make it look like this place is is is, you know, uh, populated. Populated. Yeah. Some would some would say a party, but. Yeah. Yes, populated. Right. And, uh, you know, we cut back to the family at the airport. And, you know, Kevin's mother is still kind of freaking out. Like, she's just generally getting more frustrated. And one, we... one thing I wanted to say with the, you know, the setting up of the dummies, you know, is, you know, like, how does he know he, they're still out there or out there at all? Yeah, and he created like... this system so quickly. Well, yeah, and then he's just, you know, we see him back and forth yanking the ropes, and, like, how how would he know when to stop? Yeah, like, was he just there for hours? I don't understand. It, it's, it's, it's good workout for the arms, I guess. Yeah, this eight-year-old's really going to be ripped. Soon he won't need a mannequin. To, he won't need mannequins to defend himself. Uh, then we get to the, the pizza delivery boy scene it's one of my it's probably my favorite scene in this movie it's where uh kevin directs the pizza boy to the back door and he uses the this uh fake movie in in the movie you know fill angels with filthy souls and uh he rewinds and fast forwards this movie to ask the pizza boy like oh how much do i owe you and then and then he uh he fools the pizza boy into thinking that he gets shot at when the gangster in the movie starts shooting at him with a Tommy gun. Which, you know, I don't know why the pizza delivery guy doesn't just call the cops afterwards when he runs off. Yeah, I don't if I got shot at by what I thought was a Tommy gun, I'd probably be calling the police. Or just shot at at all in general. <laughs> Yeah, I'd probably be calling the police, but, you know, I'm no expert. Maybe this pizza delivery boy had bigger plans in mind. Hey, he's like, at least I got a tip, you know? He didn't even get a tip. (laughs) Well, his tip was his life. His tip was his life. His tip was not getting shot at. Um, But then we see that Kevin's mother is trying to buy a ticket from other... uh, from other you know passengers that already have um uh seats on a plane and you know she you see her getting real desperate uh because she's she's willing to give up a lot of materialistic things like she's willing to give up her her ring her earrings her rolex watch you know she's kind of showing that she cares Uh, she cares about her son more than she does her things that's the true meaning of Christmas. Yeah, it's very sweet. Uh, but then we actually get in, the, you know, Kevin McAllister goes shopping. He has a funny interaction with the cashier. And 
Uh, then we get into you know the actual robbery part. Yeah, this is. That's. I think that little interaction when he goes shopping between the grocery clerk and him might be one of my favorite scenes of the movie because it's just the back and forth, and then he's like, you know, she's asking him all these questions, and he's like, ah, oh, that. Oh, don't worry about that. It's for the kids. Yeah. I mean, this is a freaking. This is obviously an eight-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to be all suave and, you know with, a, like, a sense of charm to him, like, yeah, I'm here just getting my groceries. D don't, yeah, don't worry about is, it. Yeah, this is a Let's... regular occurrence for me. <laughs> this is a... Yeah, this, this, is, this is just a Friday night. What are you, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, then we get... And... Then we see uh, Marv. Uh, they send Marv to check out to see if the if Kevin's house really is empty. And uh, Kevin, uh, he, again, uses the movie, the fake movie inside the movie, uh, to fool Marv into thinking he's getting shot at. So he makes he makes Marv think that, uh, like there are there are already robbers in the house or something like that. And he puts firecrackers in a bowl and he he puts the movie on like max volume. Yeah. And he makes Marv run away. Uh. But uh, this only this only makes uh. Joe Pesci, the, Joe, Joe Pesci and Marv, they kind of just want to see what's actually going on here. So they stay, and eventually they actually, they actually want to rob this place. I mean, yeah, they're, they're staking out thinking that other robbers are in there. They're like, you know, we run this neighborhood, you know, we got to see who these other guys are. And then, you know, later on as they wait, you know, they see um, Kevin come out, he's chopping a tree down for a christmas tree and they're like oh we got him he's home alone but like how do they know that there weren't guys that were in there that came out <laughs> maybe kevin mccallister just killed them both <laughs> oh, no. well yeah just because they see him come out and you know chopping down a tree doesn't mean that they you know they don't know for a fact is what i'm saying but they they roll with it yeah uh, but then uh, we get this funny interaction between uh, a musical group and Kevin's mom. Yes, the great John Candy. Uh, so anyway, uh, Kevin's mom is at a, an airport, and she's trying to get a. She just has to get one final flight to Chicago, and they don't have any flights for Chicago. And she's like, I need to see my son. And you can see kind of her, her breaking. You know, she's getting really frustrated at this point. And uh, the the music group is like, oh, you know, we're headed, we're headed uh, somewhere. But Chicago's on the way there. Do you need a ride? We can give you a ride. And so, you know, uh, you know, it just shows like, oh, this is, this is again what the true meaning of Christmas is. You know, you just have to be kind to others. I mean, you know, her frustration in this scene is, you know, it's valid because, yeah. you know, you know, the, the whole concept of this movie is like the scariest thing for two different groups of people here. You know, you have, you know, if you were an eight year old home who was home alone and forgotten and then there were people trying to break in your house, that'd be pretty freaking scary. Yeah. And then if you were on the flip side of that, if you were, you know, the parent and your kid was left home and you didn't know what they were up to and you know if they were alive it's pretty scary for a parent yeah so it's kind of just like you know it's a simple premise really mm -hmm. um and you know i don't think it tries to be anything more than it actually is you know yeah like it there's fun, there's crime and comedy, and there's a heartfelt, you know, Christmas message like there should be in Christmas films. Yeah, that's what makes it a classic. It's not trying to be more than what it is. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, Kevin, he overhears uh, Henry and Marv. And they're gonna. He knows that they're gonna try to rob his house at at what is it nine p.m. 
and uh, so he starts preparing some defenses. And uh, he also goes to visit Santa. Yes. Um, this is this is another one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Um, so he comes a little a little late to the little Santa's workshop they have set up. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know they're closing up, and you know he has this funny interaction with the with the teenager that is pretending to be Santa's elf, and and she's like, oh, he's getting into his car. And uh, he walks up to the Santa, and th- this guy playing Santa has like a cigarette in his mouth. And and he walks up to Santa, and he's and he's like, "Oh, I know you're not Santa, but I know you work for him." Yeah. And, I mean. <laughs> and uh, so, Kevin Kevin just like asks he asks him to pass along a message to the real Santa. And he basically says, "Okay, I want my. I don't want any presents or any toys. I just want my family back." And you know, it's just a nice interaction. And before you know, the Santa can't give him any candy canes, but he does give him a couple Tic Tacs. So I mean, it's it's a nice. What I, what I enjoy about the scene is, you know, oftentimes you you see this kind of thing in like other Christmas movies where uh, you know there'll be a fake Santa just getting off a shift and then they'll kind of like you know not go back to the bit you know I like that he can. this guy didn't have to continue the bit oh uh, yeah I of, think he just wanted to play Santa for this kid well yeah cause this is an 8 year old kid he, yeah. he doesn't have a lot right now mm-hmm. and um, you know he does the little gesture with the, the tic tacs yeah, and it's 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 a it's a nice moment. Yeah, for sure. And uh, but, uh, but who who would give Santa a parking ticket? Yeah. Also, like, how could they give Santa a parking ticket? What kind of monsters would do that? Uh, then we get then we get the church scene. This is another one of my favorites, just because of how heartfelt it is. Um. So. He go, Kevin goes to this big church and the, the church choir is there and they're singing and they're, it's pretty beautiful they're singing and uh, he finally has a real interaction with the uh, the man he has feared the supposed shovel man yeah the supposed murderer and so him and the shovel man start to talking and they're talking about Christmas and family and we find out that um, you know, the the shovel man gives some words of wisdom, like, oh, well, your family's always going to be your family. You can hurt them, they can hurt you, but they'll always they'll always still be your family. That's exactly what a murderer would say. And uh, uh, we find out that he has disconnected from his son because they got angry at each other at some point, and he's too mm-hmm. scared to contact his son because he's afraid of being rejected. Yeah. And Kevin just tells him to go for it. You know, the old, you can really tell that the, the shovel man really needed to hear that. It's just a nice interaction because while Kevin might be young, uh, he, you know, even though he's young, his words, you know, they still mean something to this old man. It's just yeah. a sweet, sweet interaction. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I do think it's a very heartfelt and sweet scene. But I, I do feel like it is, you know, slightly uh shoot in to the story you know like it doesn't feel like it feels like it would be the same you know movie if, uh you know you, you took out this stuff with shovel man and his son and then like the little snippet at the end we see of them reuniting but then again i guess that wouldn't like fully show why he would uh, show up to the house for uh, Kevin. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, after that, you know, heartfelt scene, uh, the robbery and what this movie is most famous for finally starts off. <laughs> so, Kevin McAllister needs to defend his home from robbers. And so he, he sets up a bunch of traps. 
You know, oh, who he, does he now? He puts ice on yeah, the steps. He, he'd give Jigsaw, Jigsaw a run for his money. Yeah, I bet Jigsaw saw this movie and wanted to. He's just like, what if they made a darker Home Alone? <laughs> Jigsaw wanted to be Kevin McAllister when he grew up. Yeah, you're damn right. And uh, so he makes, he puts like ice on the steps. He makes like a tar and feather machine. He heats up uh, the handle of, of the door. He puts toy cars so they slip. He puts nails in the steps. Like, a, like this is a quiet place. And, you know, he just does a ton of these things. He, he even makes, he even has a blow, a blowtorch trap set up. You know, he really okay. thought of everything. Because somehow this eight-year-old kid is this engineer, uh, is this good with engineering and is this mechanically inclined with just random household crap. Yeah, he even sets up a zip line from his window to uh, his treehouse. I mean, that's probably the most doable out of all of them. Besides just throwing random shit on the floor. Um, but the, the, the stuff he's able to pull off in that amount of time, no less, is not that likely. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, then we get that classic scene where uh, Kevin hides, or he 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 uh, he hides by the by the door with a BB gun, and he shoots uh, Joe, Pe Joe Pesci in the balls with the BB gun, and then he shoots Marv in the head with the BB gun, and you know, then they then they fall on the ice, they slip a bunch, Joe Pesci burns his hand. You know, Nothing says Christmas like almost killing two men. Yeah, when well, you're only eight years old, you know it's got to be done. <laughs> then Marv eventually gets into the house through the basement, and he gets like beat up by a bunch of different things. He gets a nail through the through the foot. That's yeah, probably... just, I mean he's just like like to a certain point. To a certain point, they are pretty clumsy. They're just like I think clumsy. they could. <laughs> well, I think they could have probably you know if they just took a second you know not slept on some of those cars and whatnot well like you you alluded to this earlier you know there's that just spike on the stairs and we get just like a like a quiet place you just step right through the foot yeah at least in this movie they gave a reason for a, a nail to be uh upside on the stairs but who am i <laughs> we don't need to get into that <laughs> uh but yeah i'm so and then Joe Pesci's uh, head, he, he basically gets turned bald by the blowtorch trap. And, uh, you know, th these guys are getting angry. They're like, I'm going to kill that kid. Which, you know, they've had plenty of times previously to do. Yeah. And they haven't yet. You know, at various points in this movie, there are times when either side could very easily kill the other ones. You know, Kevin could very easily kill Harry and Marv, and Harry and Marv could very easily kill Kevin. Yeah, but I guess in a Christmas movie, you can't have people murdering each other. Well, unless it's Die Hard. <laughs> oh, but we'll that's, get an to that. that's an exception. That's an exception. Um, but yeah, then you get the you you get the the most. What's the most famous trap in Home Alone? Probably the paint can one. <laughs> Yeah, I'd I'd say probably the paint can or uh you know the I think the iron is pretty good because you know it leaves that mark yeah. on Marv's face. But if we're being realistic here, it's probably the paint can one. Uh but uh yeah, Kevin McAllister gives well, uh, I mean, both these men brain damage. I mean, hitting. it's just the fact that you know all this is happening in rapid succession, and you know there are like several times where Marv just gets hit back onto the floor onto the you know the like concrete floor yeah you know head for her head first you know like i don't know how he is and unconscious at like, least like this guy definitely has brain damage <laughs> like this yeah i i don't know how he's able to get back up again uh but then uh then they almost they after the paint can scene they almost catch kevin in fact marv even manages to grab his foot but then kevin grabs his brother's tarantula and drops it on marv's face now this is the point where if Nando was one of the robbers, he would be. Uh, I I honestly probably just die of shock. Uh, uh yeah, I am very terrified of spiders. 
probably my biggest fear. And uh, okay, we don't need to get into your life stories, <laughs> buddy. But, uh, but you know, the, yeah. the tarantula is on Marv. You know, and he's scared to death. But you know, and then there's this great scene where um, the you know Harry gets knocked out on the floor, and the tarantula crawls on him, and then uh, he kind of wakes back up, and Marv is trying to get the tarantula off of him, so he tries to like whack it off of him with a crowbar. <laughs> yeah, with a crowbar, and the spider moves, and so he just freaking crowbars Harry right into the stomach. Yeah, it's like he's Joker with Jason Todd. So basically, yeah. Kevin's just, you know, using them against each other at this point. <laughs> yeah, he figures he can't beat them, so he'll just make them beat each other. <laughs> uh, so then, uh, uh, Kevin uh, uses his uh, zip line to zip line to his treehouse. And uh, as as they discovered this zip line, there's, I, I didn't remember this line being in the movie. But when, when Marv looks out the window and he doesn't see the zip line, he's like, oh, maybe he committed suicide. I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, that went surprisingly dark. I didn't, I didn't ever remember that. Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't expect that in a, a family film. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Joe Pesci and Marv, being the geniuses that they are, decide to hand <laughs> Joe climb. Joe Pesci and Marv. Not Harry and Marv. <laughs> Joe Pesci and Marv. I refuse to call him T Henry. He's Joe Pesci, He's Joe Pesci to me. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they start to hand, like, manually climb the zip line. And so Kevin takes out a pair of garden shears and uh, cuts the zip line. Which, this is my problem now. Sure. Kevin can do all this stuff from before, but I do not think that an eight-year-old would have the strength to be able to cut a wire like that with garden shears. Nah, never know. Oh man, I don't even think I could do that now, let alone an, let alone an eight-year-old like Kevin McAllister. But hell, apparently Kevin McAllister is a superhuman who can build and do anything. Yeah, he's quite he needs the to for the sake of plot. Quite the engineer. <laughs> yeah, like someone get this guy a. A de degree in mechanical engineering somewhere. Uh, yeah. But eventually the wet bandits corner Kevin McAllister and they, they prop him up on like a, a, a what, they prop him up on like a door and you know they, they're just threatening him what they're gonna do with him but then Shovel Man comes out of nowhere and <laughs> knocks out the wet bandits. Yeah, he's just like surprise motherfucker and then he bops him in the head. With his shovel, with his trusty shovel. Once a shovel man, always a shovel man. Yeah, and the wet bandits get caught, and the cops are like, "Oh, you left the water running. We know you're the wet bandits. Now, uh, now we're gonna we're gonna charge you for all those other crimes too." I uh, know. That's pretty a nice little conclusion. But uh, Kevin leaves cookies and milk out for Santa. And uh, we have this nice. We cut. We finally cut back. It's been a little bit since we've uh, cut back to Kevin's mother. But uh, Kevin's mother is uh, driving with these this little musical group. Yeah, and I, I love these interactions between uh, Kevin's mom and Gus and the Poco Band. And, you know, I just I just want to see a background movie with uh, you know how the polka band got there because they're like talking about oh you know how had all these hits in the 70s you know polka this and uh, love me polka baby and all that stuff it's like yeah. when are we gonna get the the gus polensky uh polka movie <laughs> well obviously we can now because of john candy's gone but i would have i would have enjoyed seeing that uh but yeah they have this nice little interac interaction about parenting and it's it's nice and sweet but uh on Christmas morning, Kevin wakes up and he goes downstairs and eventually his mother arrives home. It's and, a Christmas miracle. Yeah. And you know, they they're happy to see each other and then the rest of the family shows up because they managed to get a flight back home. And then Kevin's Kevin's older brother who is mean to him calls him cool. Yeah. Because I'm sure that will last. And then, between the brothers. And then we, uh, Kevin looks out the window and sees that Shovel Man has reconnected with his son. And uh, that's how the movie ends. Everything that could go back to normal did go back to normal. 
yeah that was it and that was that was it that was it good movie but uh why don't we go into our final thoughts and ratings here why, uh, why don't you go first i guess i'll start uh you know home alone like we said so many times before it's one of those it's one of the first christmas movies you think about when you think about the phrase christmas movies I mean, and for good reason. It's an enjoyable film that I, the whole family can watch. Um, there's great moments of comedy and, you know, especially slapstick. Um, I, didn't, I don't think we really talk about just how good, uh, you know, Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern were with, you know, the slapstick aspects of the movie. Because, um, you know, it's one thing to do, like, you know, dialogue comedy but it's in a completely different ballpark to be good at slapstick and you know to for joe pesci to go from one thing like goodfellas to home alone in the same year yeah it's a pretty uh dynamic year Mm -hmm. that's for Um, sure but you know this is just a it's a nice enjoyable film it goes by quick um and it's it's just a lot of fun you know it doesn't try to do anything miraculous you know you're not going into this movie you know analyzing the direction or cinematography it's just it's just fun and it's the got the christmas spirit yeah that, and... that, that's that's probably a good way to describe this movie christmas spirit like this is you know this is like the seminal christmas feeling type thing you know they it, yeah. it's got the buzz of you know like you know chaos around the holidays of trying to get everything right and whatnot and then just you know it plays on that childhood on un, you know uncertainties and fear and it's just a it's a joy i'd probably give it a uh, uh, seven out of ten. Uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with everything you said. Like as you said, this movie definitely has the Christmas spirit in it. There's a reason why it's a classic. And if if you hadn't if you haven't rewatched this movie in many years, then I'd recommend doing it. Uh, but anyway, for this movie, I'm gonna give it a seven point five out of ten. Pretty solid. Uh, but with that, that that ends our that ends our episode. Well, we've uh, made it through another episode. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Let us know your thoughts on Home Alone, uh, how you think it holds up through uh, nostalgia. And, um, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, I guess we can uh, give a little tease to our next episode, because boy, oh boy, I sure wonder what it could be on the next one. Yeah, it really is quite the mystery, but I'll say it. Oh, would... I am very thankful for that. You wouldn't believe it. It would be Home Alone 2. Where the... are they going to go this time, Nando? The They're going to the Big Apple, New York, and a certain future president makes an appearance. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh... Wait, Tim Curry was never president. Well, that's what the government wants you to think, Chase. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye. Bye.